don't have the, the second page or you know you have one but not the other it's coming so just make sure when you leave today you leave with uh, I tried to print it front and back because I was trying to save paper and trees and no such luck so I'll have to go back to I have to go back to printer class 101 and take that again and figure out what I did wrong we begin this um, this morning a study of the book of Jeremiah so if you'd be opening your Bibles to that, we're really not going to get into Jeremiah today. Um, if you're familiar with the classes that I've taught over the years, uh, you know this will be an introductory class. This will cover if you're visiting for the first time uh, or if you're here, uh, you just happen to be with us today for one time. Uh, we go through the entire book of, of Jeremiah and we talk about it. Now, it's 52 chapters. And so, you know, our, our thought with covering that is, or my thought with covering that is, you know, we won't get through all that, but we will have a general overview of the book and some relevant comments. And then the second page that you will receive, which is the back, um, we'll talk toward the end about uh, what, the, what the weeks look like from the standpoint of what we'll be, what we'll be studying. That's fine. Mass confusion. Huh? Well, <laughs> I, I don't even slam a door that hard. Well, let's start off this morning by level setting on, on what we know. Tell me something that you know about Jeremiah without looking at your handout. Okay. Okay. He was put in a pit because he was doing what? Okay. Okay. He was put into a pit. We will, we will cover that. He was put into a pit because he was preaching that doom was coming and that the house of Judah, of which the capital of the house of Judah is what? It's the capital of the house of Judah. Hmm? Jerusalem. What's the house? What's the capital of the house of Israel at this point in time when we're talking about Jeremiah? It's the capital. See, we're not good Old Testament scholars. We're not good Old Testament scholars. Now, why are we? Why do we study Jeremiah? What's the What's the purpose of studying the book of Jeremiah? What's the purpose? What? Okay. I'll go with prophecy, but how many of you were in the Romans class last session, last time? You should be able to tell me what the purpose of studying Jeremiah is. Romans 15, verse 4. The things that were written aforehand were written for what? For our learning. So it's not a, it's not a if or then it's a Bible commandment. The things that were written afore, aforetime were written for our understanding that through patience of the scriptures we would learn. Jeremiah is a book that teaches us many things. Mike? I think so. And I've said on many occasions that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So that's just one of those. Sure. That one. Did it print the first page again? Did it print the first page again? No. Oh, okay. All right. So, again, Romans 15.4. So we're studying the Old Testament. What do we know about the Old Testament combined with the New Testament? All scripture is inspired by God. And that means what? What does the word inspired mean? God breathed. Okay? It's God breathed. This book is important. This book teaches lessons. Every Old Testament book teaches lessons. How many of you have studied the book of Lamentations? That's another book that was written by Jeremiah. How many of you have done a, a good deep dive into Lamentations? 
What was the original name of Lamentations before we, we renamed it to Lamentations? What was it called? The Tears of Jeremiah. As he weeps over the city, as the people are taken away into captivity, as those people walk by him and he sits at the gate and he weeps for the city of Jerusalem. Let us return to our ways. Let us return to our old paths and follow God. Is this book relevant for today? If you've studied the book of Jeremiah at all, do you think this book is relevant for today? If you don't, I'll show you a slide next week that will compel you to believe that it is. It is the table of contents out of the latest spiritual sword. And every single topic in that spiritual sword edition is covered in the book of Jeremiah. Every single one out of one is missing. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, 14, he asked his disciples, or he asked his apostles, a very simple question. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What was their answer? Well, what did he say before that, though? He said something very important before that. He said, some say, some say you're Jeremiah. What a compliment. What a compliment. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And that question was not just directed at those apostles, lo, these many centuries before us. That question is directed at us today. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? Studying this book, studying the man Jeremiah, is important to us. Now here's another question for you. Someone mentioned prophecy. Jeremiah is a prophet. What does the word prophet or prophecy mean? What's the literal meaning of that word? And when I heard this, I heard this in a sermon a few years ago. And I had to go home and look it up because I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. As much as I've studied the Bible, I did not realize that's what this meant, the, the literal meaning of the word prophecy. What does it mean? You'll be surprised. It means to bubble up. To bubble up. So what does it mean when a man was a prophet? What was he bubbling up? What was he bubbling up? The word, of God. the word of God is what he was bubbling up. You're exactly correct. So prophecy and the prophets bubbled up the word of God and spoke to the people. They weren't their own words. They were the words that bubbled up inside them. And they spoke for God. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets bubbled up about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves. These are the prophets. They were serving not themselves but they were serving you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good, news, the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. So you're the benefactor of these prophecies. You're the benefactor of these things that were bubbled up through the prophets. These are the things that were spoken of old that angels desired to look into, but that only now we know, that plan of salvation. And so as we begin to look at the book of Jeremiah, 
we begin to look at a man who in probably 47 out of the 52 chapters preaches nothing but doom. Preaches nothing but doom. Your sins have caught up with you. There's no chance for forgiveness. In one chapter, God tells Jeremiah, don't you pray for these people. Don't you pray for these people. Their sins have caught up with them. But Jeremiah is not a prophet of doom. Quite the opposite. We find in one of the chapters in Jeremiah that he buys a plot of land. He buys it in hopes of knowing, or in the the, the reality of knowing, that the children of Israel are coming home someday after the seven-decade captivity. Jeremiah is a man of hope. He's a man of hope. Yes, he preaches the doom and destruction of the house of Judah. The house of Israel has already gone into captivity. We'll look at that next week in our uh, extensive coverage. And if, 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 if you are not a student of history, if you're not a student of ancient history, come next week and I'll bore you to death. And I promise I won't bore you anymore with history after that. But next week, the title of, of, our, of our lesson together is, How Did We Get Here? And by looking at the books that precede this, we see the sad story of how the children of Israel, now in Assyrian captivity, and the house of Judah, which at the end of this book go away into Babylonian captivity, how they got to where they are, or where they were at that point in time. Let us search and try our ways and return to Jehovah. Jeremiah says in Lamentations 3, verse 40. So he wrote the book of Jeremiah. Well, he really didn't write it. He wrote it by the hand of Baruch, B-A-R-U-C-H. You'll see his name mentioned throughout the book of Jeremiah. He wrote it at the hand of scribe. He wrote Jeremiah, and he wrote the book of Lamentations, but he wrote uh, some other books. What other books did Jeremiah write? Do we know? What other books did he write? Would it surprise you to know he wrote First and Second Kings? wrote 1st and 2nd Kings. Now, to be fair, scholars are divided. Some say it has the mark of his writing in it or the mark of Barak's writing, his scribe that wrote these things for him. Some say he did, some say he didn't. I, What little research I've done on it, because it's not really that compelling a point to me, my research shows that he probably did write the book or those books. First and Second Kings. So we have a man who's lived a hundred years after Isaiah, and who now lives at a very tumultuous period in the history of Judah. Now, just to remind us, there were twelve tribes, and I won't ask you to name them this morning. Maybe next time. But during the reign or after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom became divided. Divided into a northern kingdom, which was called Israel, with a capital at Samaria, and a southern kingdom, Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem. We have a number of kings. How did we come... How did we come to have a theocracy where God rules and now we have kings? All right. What was the scripture? What's the scripture that you would quote? You don't have to know the scripture. Just roughly say, what did the people say? We want to be like everybody else. You heard that in today's society? There are people out there in our society today who want to be so different that they all begin to look alike. You see them on TV. You see them on YouTube. You see them them splashed about everywhere. Oh, we want to be different. And they end up all looking the same. And that was the problem with the people of Israel. 
They were not happy with God. They were not happy with a the theocracy. They were not happy with God being their ruler. They wanted to be like everybody else. Good thing or bad thing? As long as they followed God, they were okay. What happened the minute they veered away from that? Jeremiah is the result of this drifting away. Key verses. I think I, I, think I wrote some down. He, he took my hand out. Jeremiah 3.25, probably the key verse, and it will be referred to over and over and over again. We lie down in our shame, and our dishonor covers us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. At one other point in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 8, verse 20, I don't know if this is one that's on your sheet or not, but this is also, I think, a key verse. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. we have a number of prophecies or have a number of prophetic sayings by Jeremiah that have a lot of value. Jeremiah was a man who started his prophetic utterances at a very young age. He started at a very young age, as did the king that he served, Josiah, who started his reign over Judah at a very young age. As we look at Jeremiah's beginnings, I would like for someone to turn to 2 Kings. That's not the one I want. There we go. 2 Kings chapter 23. Everybody turn over to 2 Kings chapter 23. That's where we're going to spend the next few minutes. We're going to be talking about a little early on now about what Josiah came into when he came to be king. We had good king Hezekiah. And I say good king because there were a few good kings and then there were some real stinkers. Hezekiah was a good king. Who was the prophet that prophesied in the time of Hezekiah? Starts with an I. Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied in the time of Hezekiah. Now, it's 100 years now since Isaiah. When Hezekiah died, Manassas took his place. And Manassas was an evil king. He did, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. His son, Ammon, who took an Egyptian name as king of Judah, was no better than his father. But from Ammon came good king Josiah. And as we read in 2 Kings 23, Josiah had a mess on his hands. The books of the law were found at some point during Josiah's rule. Where were they found? The books of the law were found in the temple. They were lost, yet they were found in the temple. Does that, the irony of that, does that not even... This is the temple of God. This is the temple of, of where, where God tabernacles with his people. And the book of the law was there all the time. But nobody chose to read it. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. We've got a lot of that in our world today. Again, 
the relevancy of Jeremiah the relevancy of all of the books of the Old Testament, because that wasn't even quoted from Jeremiah. That was quoted long ago in the book of Judges, that every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so Josiah comes to rule. And in 2 Kings chapter 23, it says, Then the king, Josiah, he sent and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets, all the people, small and great. No one was excluded. No one was told, you're not good enough. No one was told, you're not on the role of the saved and you don't have to worry about anything. And nobody was told, you're not going to be saved, so why even bother? Everyone came, great and small, old and young, priests and prophets, the small and the great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. Again, the irony cannot escape you. The book of the law found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul. What is your reasonable service to God according to Romans? What is your reasonable service to God? Okay, so if I show up on Sunday morning and I show up on Wednesday night and I show up on some Sunday nights, I'm doing my reasonable service. Yes? Is that my reasonable service? No. God will be God of all or he'll not be God at all. What must you give to God? What must be your reasonable service? I'm sorry? Everything you have, body, soul, spirit, everything must be given to God. If you're giving anything less, there's the door. You don't even need to be here. Your worship will not be acceptable. You must give your whole heart to God. The king commanded that all the statutes... And all the commandments and his testimonies and the statutes, he would follow with all of his heart and all of his soul. All of his heart and all of his soul. To perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And all the people, all the people joined in to that covenant. And he commanded Hilkiah, the high priest. Who's Hilkiah? Who is Hilkiah? He is a descendant of Aaron, that is true. He is one of the high priests. But more importantly, who is Hilkiah? He's Jeremiah's father. Hilkiah is Jeremiah's father. And he served King Hezekiah. He served the other kings. And now he and his son are serving Josiah. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asheroth, and for all the other hosts of heaven. So what had, they, what had, what had been done based on this? Based on this reading, what had been done? So the temple of the Lord was now a house for Baal. It was now a house for Asheroth. It was now a house for all the other lower G gods that these people were worshiping. And so all of those things were brought out. And they burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and carried the ashes to Bethel. And he deposed the priests who were the kings of Judah or whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem, 
those were also those who had also burned incense to Baal and to the sun and to the moon and to the constellations and to all the host of heaven. And he brought them all out, the Ashtaroth from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kedron. And he burned them in the brook Kedron and beat them to dust and cast the dust of it upon the graves of the common people. And he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the Ashtaroth. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and he defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on one's left at the gate of the city. However, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. And he defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon, that no one might burn his son or daughter as an offering to Molech. Molech was a god that the people worshipped that required human sacrifice. More than that, he'd required human sacrifice of children. The spirit of Molech is alive today. And he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. Why would he remove the horses that the kings had dedicated to the kings of Judah. Why would he remove the horses? What had God said about the children of Israel having horses? You have to go back to Numbers and to Deuteronomy. Like the people around them. Right. Exactly correct. So one of the early commandments that God gave to the children of Israel is you're not to have horses. You're not to have horses for battle. Because again, you'll be like the others and you'll make chariots. And God did not want them to do that. God wanted them to depend on him for the victories. He removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain which was in the precincts, and he, bear, he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars on the roofs of the upper chambers of Abbas, where the kings of Judah had made, and the altars that Manasseh had made, two courts at the house of the Lord, he pulled down and broke into pieces and cast the dust of them into the brook Kedron. He broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the ashtrium and filled the places with the bones of dead men. Moreover, the altar of Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, so we're now all the way back to the sons of Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin. That altar with the high place he pulled down and burned, reducing it to dust. And as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mount, and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it, according to the word of the Lord that the man of God proclaimed who had predicted these things. On and on and on you read down through this 23rd chapter of 2 Kings about what King Josiah had to clean up. So as you begin reading in the first chapter of Jeremiah, you see that all these things are retold, but they're compressed into the things that he was told, the things that the word of the Lord came to him in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Josiah was a very young man when he came to the throne, as was Jeremiah at this point in time, probably a lad of about 14. But he was able to prophesy because God allowed him, as we saw, to bubble up. The word prophet, prophesy, means to bubble up. And he spoke, for, he spoke for God. And he spoke for him for many years until he himself was taken to Egypt. And so as we look at these chapters in Jeremiah, we find that God 
calls Jeremiah to become a prophet. And he tells him in the first chapter of Jeremiah, in verse 5, one of the verses that is very popular today, now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were formed in your womb, in your mother's womb, God knew you. He knew your name. He knew what you were going to make of your life. And because you're a free agent, a free moral agent, he doesn't know what the end will be, but he knows that he's given you choice to follow him or to not follow him. You realize by doing nothing, you will end up in hell. You don't have to do anything to go to hell. You don't have to do a thing. But God has requirements. God has things that are conditional on your salvation. And these are the things that the children of Israel in an earlier time before the plan of salvation was put in place by the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, there were things that the children of Israel needed to do. Go home this afternoon and read Deuteronomy 4. If you're, if you're following the Lehman Learner, that's today's lesson. And it dovetails very well with what we're talking about here because in Deuteronomy 4, Moses talks about what to do to be acceptable and the rewards that come from that and what to do to not be acceptable to God for the children of Israel for that day and time. At one point in the book of Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah, walk through the city of Jerusalem and find how many righteous people. It harkens back to Abraham. Abraham was asked if God could find how many righteous people. How many, how many righteous people did Abraham ask God to find or to find in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? How many did he ask him to find? At first. At first, but finally. What was the final count, the final tally? Ten people. God tells Abraham, find ten people. I'll spare the cities. Jeremiah is told to go through the city of Jerusalem and find how many righteous people? How many righteous people? Find one. And he couldn't. He couldn't. Continually, 47 out of the 52 chapters in the book of Jeremiah, God conveys warnings of impending doom. They're couched in various terms. There's a wind coming from the north. He uses a lot of natural examples to talk about who's coming. There's a wind coming from the north. And it's going to consume you. There are lions coming from the north. And they will tear you to pieces. All of these are representative of the kingdom of Babylon and the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. We'll talk about more about that next week. When Israel goes into captivity 100 years before, who took them into captivity? The Assyrians took them into captivity, specifically Ashurbanipal, the king. Assyria was at the zenith of its 
time on this earth, as powerful as the most powerful nation on the earth. It was split. Assyria was certainly the most powerful, but Egypt was a close second. But one of the city-states of Assyria decided it wanted to go in a different direction. It was more militaristic even than the Assyrians. And this was the province, because the capital of Assyria was what? What was the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. Nineveh. Jonah went and preached to Nineveh. How many people did he convert? The whole city. I've heard, it call, I've heard Jonah called the super patriot, the sorry prophet. He ran from God. But once he came to the city of Nineveh, which took three days to traverse, it's that big a city, even the king came over to his side on, based on his preaching. But by this time, that was all gone. But one of the provinces of Nineveh, one of the provinces of Assyria, the capital of which is Nineveh, one of the provinces of Assyria rebelled against the Assyrian rule. And we'll talk more about that next week. We'll have some slides, and I'll show you some pictures of the people themselves. But that was the province of Babylon, Babylonia. The capital of Babylon was... Babylon is the capital. And the king who rose and overthrew the Assyrians was King Nebuchadnezzar. You read about him in Daniel. He was the one who Hiram talked about last Sunday night. He was the one who had boanthropy, is the medical term for what he had. He had boanthropy when he looked out upon his kingdom and said, what a good boy I am. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and they're going to be even more spectacular because I'm responsible for all of this. And at that moment in time, God struck him down and gave him a disease called boanthropy, where he grazed like an ox and ate grass. His fingernails grew out, and the hair on his head became like feathers. It's a medical term. It's a, it's a, it's a, mental, it's a mental disorder as we see it today. Find one person, and Jeremiah is not able to find one. Did you realize that there are parables in Jeremiah? There's a number of parables. We'll talk about each of them. Jeremiah is told to go to the potter's house and to watch the potter. Now, who, when we go, when you go to the potter's house, who in this parable, who's the potter? Who's the potter? God is the potter. What is the wheel that the potter uses? What does that symbolize? I'm sorry? It would be, it would be yes, it's God's plan, God's plan for his people. So you're going to put a lump of clay. <clears throat> it can be either be a person in some instances, because it's got, while I am waiting, yielded and still mold me and make me after thy will. You know the song. <coughs> mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. That lump of clay that goes on the potter's wheel is each one of you. And in this case, it represents the house of Judah. But what's wrong with the clay? What's wrong with the clay? Not the right mixture. In this case, it's too hard. It can't be molded. The potter can't work with it. It can't be molded into something usable. And so what happens? Jeremiah is told to take the pot and destroy it, symbolizing God's done with you. It's all over. He's done with you. There's also a linen belt. We'll talk about that. There's also a cistern that's broken. We'll talk about that. God's anger throughout the book of Jeremiah is unrelenting. 
It, it is unrelenting. He tells Jeremiah at one point, do not pray for these people. He would have no mercy on these people. They were going away into captivity. And they would spend 70 years in bondage because of their continuous sin. And even though Jeremiah asks God to spare them, the die is already cast. So Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. He finds the potter that shapes the clay, cannot do anything with it, and he's told by God to break the clay pot in front of the elders, in front of the temple. Destruction will fall upon Jerusalem due to their idolatry and their shedding of blood. This is a book filled with doom and gloom for the children of Israel. But it is also a book of hope because Jeremiah goes and he buys a plot of land at God's direction. He buys a plot of land. He knows the children of Judah are going away into 70 years of bondage. But there's a brighter tomorrow for them. And when they return to Jerusalem, when they return to Judah, Jeremiah already has land that he can leave to his posterity, that he can leave to his children. It's a book filled with warning. It's a book filled with hope. It's a book that talks about the new covenant. We spend an entire class talking about chapter 31, where God talks about he'll make a new covenant with his people. And he talks about Jesus. The chapter... That chapter highlights the establishment of that new covenant where he will write the law not on tablets of stone but on their hearts. Now, before we go today, we've got a couple minutes. I think they want everyone to pick up one of these. They're on the front row. Now, tell me if I'm wrong because I don't want to send people rushing to the front up there and be trampling one another and trying to get to one of these because these are, these, are so va these are valuable. These are valuable. Russell introduced this to us last Sunday night. Each of you, it's on the, they're on the front row, the front pew. Need to get you one of these. And starting next week, we're going to do five. We're going to do five a week. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. The kiddos in the classes are learning these, and they may come up to you and say a book of the Bible and expect you to give the proper response. Jeremiah, the response is repentance. Okay. Five a week. I'm not asking. I'm not asking the world of you. If you're a careful Bible student, five won't be anything for you. If you're not a careful Bible student, you probably need to rethink your position. These are up there for the taking. Take one. Maybe put it in your Bible like a little bookmark. And we're gonna we're gonna do five of them a week. And so the first week will be five. The second week will be five for a total of ten. And you'll need to know all ten of them. And yes, this is, like a, this is like a memory verse, memory class. Yes, because the kids that come out of those classes are learning them, and they're expecting the adults to know them also. So maybe you better not get embarrassed. Genesis, the beginning. Simple enough. Exodus, what would you think? Deliverance. Leviticus, holiness, Numbers, wilderness wandering, Deuteronomy, the covenant. Those are your five for next week. Don't disappoint me. Don't dis I, don't wanna have, I don't have to make you stand up on a chair and sing. All right? So we'll get out a little early today. Thank you for your participation in your class today, and we'll see you next week, good Lord willing.